Friends, Brian here for Yes You Can Play Guitar. And of course, joining us for the special interview is our good friend, good friend to our channel, all the way from the UK, the solitary adventurer. Thank you for being here. Of course, Hi. there he is. And of course, it is our great, absolute pleasure to have on our show today to talk is Scotty Baldwin, known as the live audio engineer for Prince for many years, many tours, many projects among other big artists as well. Scotty, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's, it's my pleasure. I appreciate being here with you guys. I love your show. Great to speak to you, Scotty. So I think uh, I'll probably start us off. So I'm familiar with you because obviously we've got a lot of longtime Prince fans in, in mm -hmm. Brian's Patreon community. Um, but what I don't really know is, is your background. So do you mind just bringing us up to speed with you know, where you were born and, and your, your early years? Well, I'm, I'm a Minnesota guy by, by birth. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and grew up <clears throat> listening to, with three sisters, by the way, no brothers. So we always had disco and R&B acts going throughout my house. It was just always on Earth, Wind & Fire, Lakeside, all these yeah. CV Wonder. We had a lot of music in my house all the time. My parents aren't musical. And my sisters aren't particularly musical either, but I sort of caught on to it um, being a younger brother. And, and um, so I was always in, interested in listening to music. And Prince began to be in the, in the late 70s, a sort of a soundtrack to my life as a, as a teenager or whatever at that time in Minneapolis. So I grew up hearing Prince and being a fan of 1999. That's when I got hooked in. And um uh, but it was until I heard, I'm glad this is a guitar uh, centered program because I heard Eddie Van Halen play the, the solo from Jump. I actually saw the video. And in the video, if you remember, he kind of goes like this. Like when he's about to do his hammer technique, he went like this. I remember that basically, part exactly. Basically saying to everyone, I'm going to show you what I've, what everybody has been wondering about for years. And he goes like this. And he played that part from Jump. And every one of us, little kids went and just wanted to know what that was the next day after that i went and bought a kramer guitar like eddie's i think a, a kramer focus i still have it here somewhere it's been painted many times um and quickly found out i didn't have aptitude for i took lessons and i became okay but i i didn't learn the right way i learned how to play the uh i didn't i learned all the tricks and whammy bar stuff and and hammering first and that's not the way to learn um I didn't learn the foundation, but I, I knew I had an aptitude for um, taking the guitar apart and putting it together. I got really good at that. And I got hired as a technician by a local reggae group, did a year with them, really got, got up to speed on the industry and how live music worked, and was interested in uh, sound along the way, just because I heard mixes done wrong. And I always knew something was wrong. And I had a couple of guys, Ron Miller was one and Cody Anderson, two local sound engineers here from Minneapolis who kind of took me under their wing and said, listen, what do you hear? Well, you change it. You, you go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to go get a beer. You just mess with it. And I would fix it. And I got really good at sound and then pretty much got discovered by Sheila E. At that point, Sheila and I were friends. And Sheila said, well, you're just going to come on the road with me. You're going to quit Prince as a drum tech. Along the way, I became a drum tech for Michael Bland. She just basically told me I was going to quit Prince and convinced me to go on. There. She was very charismatic. And she mm -hmm. sort of said in an Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, you're going to quit <laughs> Prince and you're, you're yeah. coming on the road with me. And I said, yeah, I'm going to quit Prince. I'm going to go on the road with you. And I started just like that. Be I became a sound engineer and um, things just sort of escalated. I kept getting discovered. I didn't have to work at a sound company for a long time. I didn't have to hump cable or set up PA. I started really mixing right away um, and was known in the industry early as being this engineer that's really soulful and has a big fat mix and, you know, and had a focus on, on vocals and drums and bass. And, you know, like I really pay attention and I, I over prepare for things if there's such a thing. And so I've always got everything laid out. I'm ready to go. And um, I've kept it musical this whole time. And it just kind of keeps happening to me. I didn't really choose engineering. It sort of chose me. And I, I continue to work. Uh, so, God, now it's my 34th yeah. year doing it. Uh, Scotty, what was the, sorry, Chris. Um, what was the okay. first board that you've learned on? What was the first board that you cut your mm. teeth on? 
Soundcraft 800B or 400B, excuse me, Soundcraft 400B. Really uh, a super great console on which to learn because it used to go out, certain channels would get blown out during the, during the show. Oh, wow. And I had to reach under the console and there was a little round um, piece of foam with a bunch of op amps, um, you know, like little proms that were stuck in there. And I would, I would take the channel and unscrew it during the band playing. And I would pop that channel out, pull it, unseat that, that prom and replace it and put it back in and then quick plug the, uh, the tape into it and, um, uh, and the ribbon into it rather. And then it would go live again. So I was really more than just a live sound engineer. I was being, I was learning how to be a, you know, basically work on a, an F1 pit crew at the same time. Like you had to do it at the same time. So um, I learned, I learned on a Soundcraft 400B. I, I have a lot of a, a affinity for that, that console. I know it well. I know how it feels. I can still feel what it feels like to, to hold, you know, to touch the pan pots. It was that ingrained in my memory way wow. before digital. So the question I have for you in the years that you've been doing this, have, have you come across something that would explain that you've got a natural aptitude for the, the mixing and the, you know, the, mm. the live engineering? That's that a really good question. You, you have. I, I think what it would have, what it would be, what sets me apart from other engineers as well <clears throat> is my ability to take in the information, the, the studio recordings, anything that we're going to be doing live, take them in and sort of present them to an artist in a conceptual way and say, how do you want to approach this song? Do you want to be aggressive? Do you want to be laid back? Do you want me to mix it this way? I give artists options and I don't see a lot of engineers fully imbibing the spirit of the material they're doing and then coming up with uh, um, options for, in, for, for artists to, as a way for me to engineer it. Um, mm -hmm. Lady Gaga was a great example. She, she knew and she recognized she's got a great eye and ear for people who have talent. And she said, I have a feeling you're overqualified for my tour. So wow. I'm going to ask more of you than I think you think I am. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, okay. And she had a list ready of, of her approach to every song. This song, I want to be aggressive. This song, I want it to be maniacal. This song, I want it to be beautiful and lush. And she had mm -hmm. her description of the songs. And I said, no problem. I got you. And I mixed those songs with certain reverbs and with certain aggression. And I go up and talk to the musician and say, hey, she really want, wants it agitated here let's lean forward in that can you play that phrase lean forward so i actually ended up being more of a i want to be careful here uh, i part musical director part psychologist for sure um yeah. certainly artistic and and every bit as important the engineers are always as important as every band member because the band members aren't heard unless the engineers are are there to to put it all together so <clears throat> I'm, I found my way to be an integral part of the band and the success of the, or failure of the band by, by being involved in the material and how it's presented. That's really interesting because that's almost the, the same instructions you would expect it to give a lighting director. Oh, for you sure. Know, I want yeah. this to be, and for you to interpret that sonically is fantastic. Is that yeah. something that Prince would do with you? Oh, for I know sure. We yeah. jump in the gun by mentioning. No, no, no. We can here. jump all around. Um, Prince sort of always let me do. He he was a chorus corrector. Um, mm. I just I just I've never said that about him before. But he was a chorus corrector. He let he knew if many were called, few were chosen. So if you if you were there, you already had the aptitude to do what you needed to do to be a part of the success of what we were doing. What he did is if he didn't like something or he felt it was straying, he would like a dolphin, he would sort of bottle nose you over or like yeah. a, a sheep, a sheep, sheep dog, right? He would sort of sheep dog you in the direction of what he said. Now, don't let it get too, don't let it get too relaxed. You know, don't let it this or let's keep it this way. Um, he always left all the effects to me. I asked him once early in mixing in maybe 2001, I said, um, is this okay? Is this, are these effects? Okay. Is it okay that I go for it on this? And he's like, you do the effects you I'll let you know if I don't hear something differently than you're doing it, but that's all on you. 
that's part of your artistry. I said, great. So any of those detuned vocals and cool things I did um, on the, God, I did them on, uh, I did them on almost all the tours. I had some cool vocal effect or the, the low voice effect, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. And one night alone, high, rainbow children. One night alone, rainbow children. Yeah. Family yeah. name and 1999 and all those sort of things. I just yeah. whole lot of love when he was playing guitar, I would do the echo that went up and then the one that went down. And I just, I would okay. go for it because Prince never wanted the thing I respect. One of the things I respect most about him is he was never, he never had any fear, was not a fearful mm -hmm. performer in any way. Um, always fully capable and, and w he had all his faculties there. He was ready to attack anything he did. And he sometimes ran in a lower gear than he should have or needed to. I I'd seen him be lazy at times as well, but normally he could just shift it into whatever gear he wanted and he would give whatever he needed to give. And he expected that out of the band. He didn't like when I don't, well, clearly he didn't like when people played it safe, you know, mm -hmm. when they would, as I say, sometimes people, sometimes people play to win. I always played to win with Prince. I'm very proud of that. Often people play not to lose. And that's mm -hmm. a big difference. There's a big difference between how that, how you we interpret our job and go about it so that I always tried to play to win. And if I made a mistake, it was going to be a, it was going to be big. Um, and I made very few, if any, I just was on top of it enough. And I could, uh, a lot of that, I attribute my success to how good the band was and how good Prince was. They always gave what I needed them to do to make the mix great. And, um, he had a, a ton of great musicians that worked with him and we all had that same sort of attitude yeah well i've got to pick that thread now that you've uh, you've sure. shown it to us when would you see him sort of not phoning it in but the, the time you used was you know being lazy was that during rehearsals sound checks um, or actual gigs I, I look at maybe my favorite tour with him as one night alone live mm. excuse me one night alone he was creative Every single day, I felt a new creativity and a new aspect of his angle. His angle was different every day because it was jazz and you had a master jazz players, Renato, Rhonda, John, you know, he, they were really, really on it. And um, so they helped guide him. It certainly wasn't the most musical tour he's ever done as far as fans. A lot of fans left okay. kind of miffed. They were like, what, what did I just yeah. see? I recognize two of those songs. This is horrible. Yeah. Um, but um, so he really worked hard on One Night Alone. I, I, I saw it in him every single day. Um, musicology, I think his mind was a little bit somewhere else. And I think a lot of what musicology was, was a response to, it could have been, I hope I don't call him out, out of, maybe I shouldn't mention the author's name. There was an author that wrote a book. Well, it's Alex Hahn. And I think he wrote a book yeah. called, I believe, The Rise and Fall of Prince. Yeah. Something like that, right? Mm -hmm. I believe Prince's musicology Possessed. tour, yeah. uh, I believe that whole tour was a response to him being looked at as being over. And um, right. because the timing fell just in line for him to respond. And Prince always responded in a musical way to yeah. challenges and things. And, you know, he so, used art so do you as think, his response. Sorry to cut you off. Do you think that that triggered the entire sort of uh coming back into the uh, i know he didn't call it a comeback where it was clearly a, a public offensive for charm you know to go on the grammys do the duet with beyonce and then this massive musicology tour you, yes. was that all do you think a response to Alex in, in my in my estimation yes because i know he was aware of the book and i think the timing just laid itself out i mean if anyone said to you or anyone else or people listening, like, oh, they're not good at this. One of the first mm -hmm. things we do is, if we know we're prove good at that, wrong. is is prove them wrong. And if we yeah. have the, we don't, most of us don't have the forum to just get out there and prove someone wrong. We don't have a stage for that, literally and figuratively. But Prince did. And so he did everything. His way of arguing, his point was to be artistic and creative and put a tour together. But on musicology, I know in the preparation for that tour, um, he didn't work as I saw it daily that he didn't work quite as hard as he did in the past. And um, he let a lot of things slide musically. 
um, I think as good a job as Greg Boyer, if you know who Greg Boyer is, the yeah, trombone trombonist. Player. Greg's a phenomenally talented uh, player and arranger. I think Greg, you know, having to arrange a trombone and two altos, it's like, yeah. you know, Candy and Maceo, it was, that was wrong from the start. And I'm sure it confounded Greg. I, I won't speak for him, but you want a section, you want five horns or three that are diverse, maybe a tenor and an alto and a, you know, or add a trumpet or something. And so instrumentation was weird. Um, Prince put Renato in a tough uh, spot on that tour because he had just come off of a jazz thing. And then he, Renato kept a lot of holdover sounds going okay. to the pop sound. And, and I don't think a lot of those worked in, in, in musicology. So I have my own definite opinions of that. And I know as an engineer and as a fan of Prince, I was out there going, mm, no, he wouldn't have five years ago. He wouldn't have done this. He would have said, no, you got to fix that, change that, do that. And I was kept waiting for that to occur. And he never, he never did it. I think he, I think he did that one for, for the reason that I stated, which is to show people that he wasn't, um, uh, he was still, should be regarded as a musical force. Yeah. I mean, I, I, obviously I never met the man personally. I only know the music and, you know, what's been fed to me through the media. But he had a lot going on in his life at that time also. Um, I think, I, you know, the, the financial rewards of that tour were kind of overshadowed in some ways by how clever and innovative it was that he was giving away the album on mm -hmm. every seat. And, you know, it, it's one of the, the, the many times where he sort of foresaw where the industry was going to go and punched it in the, the nose to show it that he, sure. you know, he had the measure of it. Um, but it's, it's really interesting that you say that. Now, we've kind of skipped over the one night alone, which in my mind, I had like a million questions mm -hmm. because, and I think timeline-wise, we're, we're, we're never going to be able to go through it, these things chronologically with you. I, sure. You know, I can tell that now. So one night alone is the first time where, for me, you could see this man wasn't invincible, that age was going to play a part mm -hmm. because it's, the dancing stops. The mm -hmm. instrumentation is out in front. He's he's basically in a double-breasted suit for you know two years at that point. Yeah. So, was that something that you were conscious of? That oh, of you course. Know, the, the physicality had slowed in that year or so since yeah. the, the the New Year's party. It was quite evident that he was um, to those of us that were close to him that he was going through pain. I didn't know that the pain management was in place per se, but clearly. He put, um, and as Brian would love about this era, he put the guitar on and he kept it on for two years. And he really showed, um, I, I, I heard a lot of growth in Prince in those two years, uh, in that whole like era where he, um, he started to think, and not only was his rhythm playing always immaculate, but his solos got really, really lyrical and full of motifs and intricate and he um although i was never god i don't i don't think i've ever even said this i was never a fan of prince's tone his guitar tone i think okay. it was very it was very nose forward it was very full of a lot of mids um and i can talk about why i think that is later but and that has to do with his hearing but um but he had such articulation during that during that time he was really, really, he was playing all the time. He was playing every day. And I think when you do something all the time, every day, you get really good at it. And I, I think his playing was just stunning. Guitar playing was stunning at that time, the early 2000s. Yeah, and he had no foil, really did he, on that tour? I mean, in tours either side, he'd have Cat Dyson or he'd have Mike Scott. Right. and Mike. Or, yeah. he, I mean, he just did everything, didn't he, on, on the One Night Alone tour? I thought it was He had to. He, he was covering everything, yeah. 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 And that's kind of naked to do that. You know, it's, it's, oh, it yeah. was, it was, it was um, a brave of him to do that, to, to say, all right, I'm going to be the only guitar in the band. Cause I asked him who's, who else is playing guitar. Yeah. And he just gave me one of those looks like, <laughs> like I need someone else. And, and I went, Oh, okay, yeah. cool, man. But I thought, yeah. wow, because I, I asked him because I, I was in that from the sensibility, I was informing my, myself where I was going to place that other player. If they're yeah. on stage and they're little and they're a little bit to stage left, I'm going to pan them that way to get out of Prince's way. And he would always be at 12 o'clock pan noon. And he didn't run a stereo signal. He was he had a mono signal. So um, 
uh, that's about placement. You know, I didn't care if someone was going to play or not. I just figured someone was and I figure out where I was going to place them. Like I would place Mike Scott different areas and um, to get a round print so that you weren't fighting all the time. But um, I was quite happy with that, that time. So when musicology came around, I thought we were going to have that same, that same attitude and the aggressive attitude. Maybe it was the fact that he was sort of over the hits. You know, he had so much new music coming out of him all the time and he was recording a lot. And that's when um, Dave Hampton came and was, was uh, I invited Dave to come out and meet Prince and Prince uh, in a perfectly ordinary sense of the, the word fell in love with Dave and had Dave come out and redo everything at Paisley Park. Um, uh, the way Paisley was, was Paisley Park was the shape it's in now is largely due the great shape it's Dave. in now. The good things had to do with Dave Hampton and Dave yeah. coming out and, and making it more a mu more musical place for Prince to work. So he was recording at a furious pace as well. Um, and at a prolific pace at that time, early 2000s. And um, so just to, just to um, I think maybe it had to do with the hits as well. He, he wanted to do new music. He had all, all these new things. And to ask somebody, to ask Donny Osmond to, to go back and sing Puppy Love, for the 20,000th time, you know, yeah. I'm sure it doesn't to, and try and emote that quality of, and they call it, puppy. you know, it's just, you can sell it <laughs> yeah. and nobody could sell it like Donny Osmond. I saw it on an angry basis and he was fantastic, yeah. but yeah. Prince didn't live in the past. He wanted to go, he wanted to move forward. Um, he once told me some, I, uh, this is one of the memories that I'm not crystal clear on, but he said something like, I know people just want to lock, he did say people want to lock me in a studio with an Oberheim and a Lynn drum machine mm -hmm. and have me cut all my records with the, the stuff from the Purple Rain era, but there's more to it than that. That's yeah. what, and what sort of saying. age was he when he, he said that to you? That was around, two, that was in 2002, yeah. where he just, he he, because I wanted to hear more old kind of stuff. I wanted to hear the big, when he didn't have a horn section, remember he treated that Oberheim, the OB8 and the OBXA as the horn section. So mm -hmm. he would gliss up whang, and he would hit his chords yep. and he would hit these chords that because he couldn't afford and didn't have a horn section. So that was effectively his horn section. And then when he yep. got horn sections and then got too cute about it, near the end, he had an 11 piece horn section or something like that. Yep. He combined a six and a five piece and it was a mess. It was a nightmare. Yeah. I didn't like this stuff. <laughs> Um, doesn't mean that everyone doesn't, you know, and that's a subjective thing. It's not objective, but the only thing I I'm objective about, it, it, I find is my job is to just be truthful because people like to, and the more time goes by is they like to paint a different picture of what things were like. And I don't think that serves Prince or the fans or his legacy what, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think just no. to be honest with the shortcomings, to be honest about the process um, is important because that lets us know that there's something in there to be learned. And Prince was a master at learning. Now, like a lot of the artists with whom I've worked, they're, they have a lot to teach. I'm surprised that they just release records and go on tour. I'm yeah. surprised more artists, artists don't do master classes. I'm surprised that... Um, I don't name name an artist, you know. Uh, well, um, yeah. we could name do, artists. But the, the thought that just came to me is: Do you think it's a financial thing? Because so much of the financial remuneration has moved now to just perform live. Do you think yeah. that someone like Taylor Swift, who you know has just come out with another album now, in the middle mm. of re-recording all of our old material, do you think there's, there's they're few and far between that people actually? care about the, the thing that it's almost like fast food isn't it do they care about the burger or that do they just want you in the establishment so that they can take your money off you yeah it that's a well it depends on what people have in the tank um prince generally would be uncomfortable with the idea i gave him in 2000 late 2001 or 2002 as we sat in takumi's office and he he was challenging me he was challenging me about uh, buying a PA, whether or not we should buy a PA, our own sound gear. And I said, it's not a good idea. Talk to Journey, talk to, there's a bunch of bands that could just tell you it's not a good idea. You're going to lose your money on that. But um, he said, well, how could we make $1.5 million quickly? Just you and me. 
to pay for that PA. And I said, because it was actually $1.6 million. And I said, well, and I had to riff. This was my version of jazz, right? And I yeah. said, well, I would go into theaters, 3,000 seat theaters or whatever I said, charge $200 a piece. You would have a grand piano, a keyboard, a bass, a guitar, and an acoustic. And you would talk and talk about your writing process and take questions from the fans and have a so VH1 and I'm, storytellers. I'm just format. making this yeah. up in front of him on yeah. the spot. And I said, that's 500 grand a show. We could do it in three weeks, maybe three, three weeks. We can make that money in three weeks. And of course he famously said, as he left the room, he goes, you're a hundred grand short because it was <laughs> $1.6 million. For them. So, um, but, but the idea there, it's a cute story, but the real idea behind that is Prince could have sat down at a grand, a keyboard, a guitar, a bass, and an acoustic and yeah. had you enthralled and teach you something so that you as a fan, when you leave there, you're better than when you came in. Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could not do that. She could do oh. it with an acoustic, but she couldn't fill up two, three hours with it. M lots of musicians and ones that I've mixed couldn't sit there and tell you their process and tell you why they do this and ba basically give a live masterclass. And, yeah. and that's why, because there's no paycheck there for them because they can't do it. Um, yeah. A lot of artists are just riding the wave, riding the wave of popularity at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. It depends. You could have the best surfer in the, I know nothing about surfing. I'm about to go into dangerous territory here. You got the best surfer in the world if they miss that wave and some novice gets it, that novice might end up looking like a genius, right? Mm -hmm. Or dying, it, it, right? You have to catch the wave. And a lot of these artists are just a product of the timing, right? It's yeah. not true art. It's a lot of bubble gum now. And I look back at artists. To me, artists are ones who can play, who can sing, who can yeah. emote and don't yeah. need to hide behind production can play yeah. an acoustic show. Uh, those are things that are probably not, I don't know, I'd probably receive criticism for that, but I'm okay. I'd stand, I'd stand with that, that, okay. um, yeah. that we've lost those people. We've lost a lot of those. And Prince was certainly one who could do all the things himself. Yeah, I think that the talent is probably still there, but they're, they're not brought up in that environment anymore. Like nobody pay, plays the clubs to become famous anymore. You know, so they're not good point. sort of back yeah, good hardened. You know, uh, I think a lot of the 80s uh, acts were kind of sold short because mm -hmm. it was the start of lip syncing. But if you listen to all of them now who are still on some nostalgia tour, there's a lot of great voices in there that, that mm -hmm. I would argue, you know, because they work clubs, because they came up through, you know, quote unquote, the system before they had their, their 10 year overnight success that it's it's that foundation that is kind of missing these days but, sure. and, um, it's, yep. and it's relating it's relating to band members as well it's it's having a proximal relationship with band members and being enveloped by sound prince always was that's why he wanted monitors he didn't want any of your monitors i got him to use them in 2002 for one, talk, on yeah. one one that alone but yep. after that he gave me his two sets just said you keep them i never want to see those things again and because he he liked being enveloped in moving yeah. air and he yeah. wanted the front of house mix the, excuse me the monitor mix to sound like the front of house mix that's why late in his career what he listened to in his wedges was my mix and not a monitor engineer's mix they just had to mix the band prince yeah. wanted that experience of being out front on stage and artists do not operate that way nowadays so an observation that I have about those in-ear monitors was he was perhaps at his vocal best when he had the IEMs in. I, I think you know, the, that's possible. Do you think that yes. led to that? Because he, he, he had absolute pitch, you know, ability um, to, to match what he was, he was getting through the monitors? I, I think he did anyway. I mean, his, you know, I somebody asked me a long time ago um, or years ago what his best instrument was. And I said keyboards and I got in some trouble for that. I got a lot of flack for that, but um, I would agree that guitar, he was, um, he was without peer as far as what he, how he played, what he played. Right. But it was very simple and blues based, his guitar stuff. 
it, he wasn't doing any crazy stuff the way somebody like uh sweep uh who who did the sweep picking brian who was the guy who did the made that famous angry momstein yeah uh, there was another guy who would who was the like the sweet pick first person i think his name started with a p i don't know anyway some whoever it was like prince wasn't doing these crazy new innovative things on guitar it was very blues based and yeah. and very base, very much based on motifs you know musical motifs mm -hmm. but um i do agree he was a phenomenal guitar player i probably backed away a little from his keyboard prowess i think he learned a lot from lisa coleman and and others but especially lisa but his vocal was his greatest instrument for sure mm -hmm. um i know susan i watched your interview with susan she said his his ideas were his greatest instrument i disagree with that i think he had great ideas i also think he had a a load of crappy ideas as well yeah. um but his voice he could be near a monitor with a terrible mix in it he could be away from monitors he could be down a ramp down the side of the stage he still sang in time and in pitch um he was <clears throat> i often thought if he if he signed a deal with the devil that had april 21st 2016 written on it somewhere at the end that that deal would have been about having a perfect voice and having mm. full control and full command of that instrument from the very first part of his life to the very last show of his life he never lost yeah. a thing in his vocal just no he unbelievable. didn't I, stunning i listened to the atlanta show you know i mean we all know that bootlegs are out there so i'm not going to mm. pretend that they're not and mm. I, I listened to it last week and i just thought i mean it, his, his vocal is absolutely flawless yeah. And within a week, the whole world changes. And yeah, he, it's, he, um... it's astonishing that, you know, he kept, I, I mean, it's a question that I don't expect you to be able to answer, but mm -hmm. I often look now at these demos that are being released on, on the posthumous, uh, you know, estate albums that are coming out. And he's singing non-falsetto in 1979 with just the same ability that he always had. But for some reason, the first three, three and a half albums, it's falsetto only. And I, I would, you know, he's never going to tell us, even if he was still alive, but right. it would be a question that I'd have is why, why would you shy away from being, you know, a full range singer for the um, first few albums? I can answer. I can, I can hazard a guess at this. <clears throat> when Please. he started, he cut a lot of those first three records and he played live quite a bit, but not on the scale and the reach and the size of venues that he had played before. And he didn't have engineers that could get that live falsetto up above the mix so that it could be heard. And there's nothing, there's nothing that frustrated Prince more than not being able to hear his falsetto live. It was always in the back of my mind. When Kiss would come up, <clears throat> um, when you were mine, I, there's certain songs that still could trigger me out of sleep you know, shake me out of sleep, just thinking they were next on the set list because I had notes that said plus seven dB, plus seven dB. Like I always right. used to turn everything, his falsetto up seven dB. So you could hear it. Um, there's nothing like the feeling of you're on stage, you're singing falsetto and you're getting run over in a venue by a band and no one can hear you singing. That I'm sure that put a little, I'm sure that's part of it. Prince would say I'm wrong and he would say that wasn't it. But I can tell you that instinctively, and as an engineer who had to deal with what was, has been given me, um, that that could have informed him. And it could have been just that he was getting out of that male-female thing as well. Yeah, the androgyny right? was a big thing. Sure, sure. And you get up yeah. to controversy and after controversy things, mm -hmm. he opened up and he opened a lot of the bottom end of his vocal up. And yeah. um, uh, we could dedicate a whole show to that about the vocal and how he, how he moved in his career, and we could make charts of where he sang in what octave on what songs. Yeah. Daddy Pop F sharp two or something like sounds like an F two in my mind, maybe F two. But uh, it's, you know, he went from Daddy Pop to whatever his highest you know thing is, yeah. and and that's a great range to move in. But and if anybody uh, of anyone, Prince had. Um, great so such great uh, presence on the mic that he would know to move in and when to back off and when yeah. to give an oh you know back here yeah. and he just he knew he was totally cognizant always aware of 
of his proximal effect to the microphone as well. So yeah. we work we work together in that way because I I always wanted to make sure his his his, his not only his vocal but his falsetto was heard loud and clear. So Scotty, I I have a lot of technical questions I want to ask you, but before mm -hmm. we get into that, there's the mandatory questions we have to ask or we'll be crucified if we don't ask. But um, uh, tell me about your first actual in-person meeting of Prince. What was that like? What was your first impressions of it? Uh, I first saw him at the fine line. I sort of went up a stairway accidentally. I wasn't supposed to. And Prince and Gilbert and one other bodyguard kind of spun around and looked at me. And I, you know, when you get that first moment you see him, it's, he had some purple and white suit on and, you know, it was like, it, it's kind of locked in my brain. And um, I just kind of backed down the stairs and uh, met him shortly after that out at a uh, rehearsal at Paisley Park that Michael Bland, of which Michael Bland was a part. And I was Michael's drum tech at that time. So Michael said, look, man, I'm going to bring you in on the Prince gig. You're going to go on tour. Mike, Michael sort of, he's a great spirit and he just sort of manifested that to come true. And so I started showing up at rehearsals and I was always sitting behind Michael to his right always and michael never had to, i told michael you never have to wonder if i'm here i will always be here and michael was so big he would break stuff and just kind of look and i'd already be throwing another symbol up or changing a drum out or whatever um and prince started to see that sort of work ethic so he started to talk to me prince was and it was particularly one day where he was playing michael's kit and he got off and he said something like i don't you know i don't hit him like he does do i and I said, and he goes, truth counts. And I said, no, man, you don't like <laughs> he does. Um, Cause he just simply didn't hit, you know, Prince was sort of hit the drum. He didn't hit through the drums. Michael always sort of hit through the right. drums. And, um, and, uh, but that was, I remember that being sort of the first back and forth. And then I just became his, probably his favorite tech, his favorite and most trusted tech, because he knew that I knew Michael's gig, even though I didn't know how to drum. I couldn't air drum the parts. I knew the different parts of the songs. I knew when the pyro was supposed to happen. The pyro guy couldn't uh, put an explosion in, in sign of the times at the right point. So I had, he's like, Scotty, can you go help him? Yep. And I was like, can I turn the key? And the guy was like, yeah, don't turn it until I was like, I know, I know. <laughs> Boom. You know, and set off the explosions in the truss. And yeah. Prince was like, was that you tonight? I said, yeah. And he's like, cool, you keep doing that. So I was sort of his go-to guy to solve the musical aspects of the technical position. And then once that pyro guy knew when it was, then I could leave and go back to things. So he just liked people who we got along because he knew I was invested and he could see I was really into it. Mm -hmm. And he just wants people, he doesn't want to look at people who aren't into it. He just doesn't want yeah. them around. So I was so always allowed me, to stay in rehearsals. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me take you back just to, to, to flesh that out. So did you know Michael? before uh, as on a sort of a, a friendly basis because he's only what 19 years old at this point right i would imagine he, yeah he had he had done we had met when michael was doing the new tour and uh michael hired me away from uh, this reggae band <clears throat> asking me hey man do you know how to set up drums and i said no i'm sorry i i don't and he said perfect like i don't want somebody who knows how to I don't want some, I will teach you what I like. Yeah. And again, Michael manifested. He was like, if I make this guy know what I like, it'll become what he likes. And then he'll be setting up for himself. So Michael Bland, I have Michael to thank for, um, I guess, attitudinally how I, is that a word? I think it is now. It a, is now. Attitudinally, <laughs> how, my, how I approach, um, how I approach, uh, I, Michael set me up for success with Prince because he taught me not to be afraid. Go ahead, set it up, man. What do you want to change? Change what you want. Yep. Cool. And I said, I think your splash should be here. That way, when you're doing that fill in this song, it's cool, cool. And Michael supported me and pushed me forward into, yep. and th you know, thrust me forward into, into my mixing career just by his attitude. So again, nail that down for me. Is, is this Michael's already been recruited by prince or he's still yes. playing in a combo or is it during that time where he, prince is he, hi he he hired me to set up his drums for sunday and monday nights at bunkers and then wednesday night at the fine line and prince would okay. come to bunkers on the fine especially the fine line prince would show up at the fine line all the time so michael i think in his way was already getting me 
ingrained, getting me used to being around Prince. And then it was natural where he fired his old tech and brought me in and I just started showing up and, um, it, he laid the groundwork, um, through already working with Prince that Prince would be, would notice Michael and I were familiar with one another and had a good relationship. And Michael sort of handed that relationship off, broke it in half and gave half to Prince. So Prince and I already had a good working relationship. And I was just relied upon to, if he didn't feel the mix was right, he would put me all the way out front with the engineer out there. And I would, and Michael's like, man, I'm cool. You go ahead. You're learning how to mix anyway, go out there and would support me in a, in a show where I would just sit out front on a headset and say, no, turn that up. That's got to go down. That's, and that was a lot of faith that both Prince and Michael had in me. So more than I probably had in myself, but I grew into it. I grew into to realizing that I had the aptitude and the, and the talent to do that. So and I've, I've heard Michael, sorry, Brian, no, I've no, heard no. Michael talk around that time about Prince would sort of sit him down with albums, you know, do you know this mm. song? And he, he wouldn't. So he'd, he'd sort of do a little musicology course for him, you know, yeah. to teach him the kind of music that, that had gone into to making Prince the play that he was. Did he ever do anything with you where he's like, I, I need a certain sound and has, you know, hmm. an album or an outtake from the vault or something? Uh, to, no, to demonstrate not, it. not specifically. Uh, <clears throat> he, there was the only time I can think that even sort of sounds like that is when he had me checking the PA in Japan in 2002, maybe it was where he said here, and he, hands me this record it was shania twain's new record um and he said make it sound like this i want the i want the sound to be like this and oh, wow. and and i think it was it possibly it, that was there was probably mutt lang her husband at the time right yeah, i think yeah. it might have been one of his productions so who doesn't like a mutt lang production i mean they sound amazing so oh, yeah. um so i i said okay cool man and i don't remember doing anything vastly different because they're just such different sounds um, but I think what he meant was make it sound compressed and fat and sort of have a big sound, big wall sound to it. That's the only thing I could think would be a difference between what I was doing at the time and what he wanted. And uh, I did try some things, especially in rehearsal. I got away with trying things like compressing the whole mix. And I found out that didn't, didn't really work well for the audience. Um, it probably worked okay for Prince, but I've always had this, um, I don't know, I, I I've always been on the side of the audience in every way because they're the, I'm out there representing what they hear. So I'm trying to put out there what they would want. And the best way I can do that is to ask what they want or feel what they want. And people, when people come up and talk to me, I'd say, oh, okay, okay, cool. And I would just, I would listen and try and say, well, that that's reasonable or that's unreasonable, but just try and be the best um, arbiter of, uh, of of a good, good faith to what the audience wanted to hear. So, and just try and represent that out front. And it started to work for me right away. Um, yeah. Because in 2000 or 2001, whatever that, one of those hit and run tours were, that it was in the US, I think, um, uh, before One Night Alone. Hmm. He was doing hits and it was going off really successfully. And the board, the recordings were coming out great. And I was cutting them to CD, CDR. You know, I would cut them straight to CD and, yeah. give him and so sadly uh it's before i was carrying a dat recorder with me they would cut off after 74 minutes so i would quick change the you know the recording uh cd but there's some gaps you know uh, depending on where what song was playing and so I, I looking back at that now in retrospect it's sad but um no matter who's mixed uh artists in the past there was a certain point at which a cassette was going to run out a mini disc was going to run out, run out. A CD was going to run out after 74 yeah. minutes. You know, you just had to deal with that until digital recording came into play. Yeah, Scott, exactly. I mean, some of those 80s B sides, you know, they'd be a lot longer. We'd have a much longer America if oh, uh, yeah, the tape yeah. hadn't run out. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 